All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Breaking Cultures of Silences, Neurodiversity and Mental Illness Advocacy in Archives. Uh, I am Mike Miller. I am your moderator for the session this afternoon. Uh, and before we get started, I have just a few uh, housekeeping items to cover. Uh, we will be utilizing the Zoom chat for all presenter questions, so please feel to, free to submit them throughout the session. Uh, we will be holding questions to the end, and I will then I will be sharing the questions with the presenters uh, as we go. Uh, if you have any issues uh, during the program and you need to chat with me directly, please do so. I'll be monitoring the chat, and I will try to help you in any way I can to make sure that you can get the most out of the session. Uh, and so with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Lyric Holmans. Lyric, you can take the mic and take it away. Awesome. All right. Let's just get that there. Thank you so much for uh, the introduction. Hopefully we've got the correct slide up there. My name is Lyric Holmans. I am a late diagnosed, multiply neurodivergent adult. And what that means in my particular case is I am diagnosed autistic and I also have an ADHD diagnosis. But the late part of that is that I didn't find out that I was neurodivergent until I was 20 nine years old when I was diagnosed autistic. I also use they them pronouns as I am a non-binary human. Uh, and if anyone here is visually impaired, I'm a light-skinned mixed race human in my mid thirties with short green teal and pur purple hair and glasses. And I've got a bit of an undercut on the side and I'm sitting in an RV, which we live in full time. And we've been staying near Austin, Texas uh, recently because uh, I I'm actually from Georgetown. Uh, so. Autism is a lifelong difference. And even though I didn't know it, I was autistic in the first 29 years of my life, even before being diagnosed. And because of that, my life and all of the moments in it have been influenced by being autistic and my autistic experience. And though the presentation, uh, my outward, outward presentation and the ways in which I cope and interact with the world may change and evolve over the world, I'm, I'm always going to be autistic. And I also, I run an autism and neurodiversity website, Neurodivergent Rebel. And this was a blog that I opened in the fall of 2016 after receiving my late autism diagnosis. And what this was for me was a way for me to process this late discovery and simultaneously share what I was relearning about myself with the wider world. And I mentioned quickly that ADHD diagnosis. I actually didn't officially get that until earlier this year when I was 33, which was four and a half years after my autism diagnosis. Although many people over the years have suggested I might have ADHD. If you know what to look for, there are definitely hints. Uh, if you look at me long enough, you'll figure them out. Uh, and so finally, you know, this year I, I wouldn't have that looked into because what the ADHDers were telling me, hey, I think this is you. And yeah, they were right. They usually are. So on our screen right now, I've got a white slide with a purple border and it reads, what is neurodiversity? Well, neurodiversity is a term that was coined in the late 1990s by Judy Singer. And Judy Singer is an autistic sociologist. And what Judy was arguing was that diverse neurological conditions and learning disabilities such as autism, dyslexia, dyscalculia, hyperlexia, dyspraxia, ADHD, obsessive compulsive disorder, and Tourette syndrome, all of which are much more common with autistic people, are the result of normal variations in human brain type or different shades of humanity, as I like to say. And what is different about neurodiversity is that it rejects the common prevailing idea that autism and other neurological processing differences should be cured and challenges the views that neurological diversity is inherently bad or pathological. And this is very important for neurodivergent people. Unfortunately, society systems have currently been set up by the neuro majority or neurotypical people, typical, a bit relative. And there hasn't been a lot of input from neurodivergent people when setting up these systems because for such a long time, we've been pathologized and told 
that we were broken and needed to try harder to flex ourselves into the current systems of society instead of flexing society systems to make more inclusive solutions for everybody. One in eight people are considered neurodivergent. And as I didn't know for many years, some may not even know it. I entered the workforce in my teens and started in the family business and then moved on to working in fast food, retail, and eventually corporate before getting into HR, operations, and business consulting. And most of my professional career was spent not knowing I was neurodivergent because the differences in the ways our mind work, our minds work are invisible. And I wasn't properly accommodated in many spaces. I entered work or otherwise. And that's one of the main reasons I began my work with organizations, asking them to change the way they recruit, write policies and design spaces so that we can make spaces that are friendly to everyone, regardless if someone discloses or even knows if they are neurodivergent or not. Because the truth is there are many people, especially in my age group, I'm 34 or older, who may be neurodivergent and not even know it. Since starting my blog, I've met people who are discovering they are neurodivergent in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and beyond. And the problem is when you're a neurodivergent person living in a world full of neurotypical people, even if you don't have words for what it is exactly that makes you different, you still have this sense of knowing you're different you likely will feel yourself struggling to do things that other people don't seem to struggle with. And you don't know why, and I'm gonna put this in air quotes, simple tasks, because simple is a very relative concept depending on how your brain works, are so hard for you. Neurodiversity gave me a new way of looking at myself and my relation to the world and people in it. It allowed me to stop operating from a place of shame or the false assumption that I was a broken or lesser neurotypical person. Now that I know the truth, I have been working to unlearn many old and unhealthy habits and live a more authentically neurodivergent lifestyle. It is extremely important for people with neurological differences or any disability to be able to speak up and not be ashamed when asking for help. And not knowing my brain worked differently meant I wasn't asking for help for many years. Strengths and weaknesses aren't inherently good or bad. They are simply part of the human experience. Everybody has strengths and everybody has weaknesses and everybody's strengths and weaknesses are different. And this is something I've had to learn and is actually the part of neurodiversity that has helped me the most and drew me in originally. As humans, our strengths and weaknesses are different and it doesn't matter if I'm bad at proofreading, for example, because some other person, many people likely have this skill because these skills are common enough that other people have them. Diversity is beautiful. Neurodiversity is invisible diversity, but it is also beautiful. It is the diversity in how our minds work. We literally think and experience the world differently. And it shouldn't matter if my personal profile of strengths and weaknesses are different if, in fact, in my world, the business world, this is often a benefit because in addition to having weaknesses that are less common, I also often have strengths that are less common. We live in this world where being able to put on a brave face is cherished, often praised. And this makes asking for help more difficult for those of us who need help from time to time, especially if we're asking for help with things that other people around us don't need help with. In one of the best organizational cultures I have ever had the pleasure of being a part of my former employer, the Austin Alliance Group, we had this team value of vulnerability based trust, where we focused on our skills, but we're also 
extremely honest and upfront with our weaknesses and struggles. And this meant team members were empowered and encouraged to speak up even if they had a hard time. Instead of hiding our weaknesses, we were honest about them and were able to gain help from each other when we struggled. And what we quickly realized was that our weaknesses weren't shameful. They were an opportunity for us to work together on common workplace issues. People were able to ask for help and speak up for their needs. And this helped everyone to show up feeling supported and ready to do their best work. So <coughs> Now, our varied sets of perspectives, skills and abilities often sparked creativity and out of the box solutions to the problems we were trying to solve for our team and our clients. And in the end, embracing neurodiversity didn't just benefit the neurodivergent people in the organization, it benefited everyone in the organization and helped to improve the organizational health of the entire company. The truth is, many things that neurodivergent people need to be successful in the workplace and in life often can also benefit neurotypical people. We neurodivergent humans can be like canaries in the coal mines, to use an analogy, because supposedly autistic people don't know how to do that, <laughs> according to this, some of the diagnostic criteria. But we shine a light on potential problems in society and its systems. All right. <laughs> so now I get to pass it to Jenna and Kelly. Let's see. And did thank you, you did so it? much, Lyric. Yes, right. thank you. I am going to share my screen. All right, up, oh, wrong slide. Can you guys see the opening slide and hear me all right? Excellent. Welcome to our segment on the Austin History Center archives, description and access to collections documenting neurodiversity and mental illness. My name is Jenna Cooper. I am the records analyst for Austin Public Library, but I work at the AHC, the Austin History Center, primarily also with City of Austin Records. Joining me today is Kelly Hannes. She is our processing archivist here at the Austin History Center. And so what inspired our section was Kelly and I had over the years had multiple talks about how the brain is not well rep represented in our collections. And myself as a neurodivergent person with ADHD, obsessive compulsive disorder and a mood disorder, of course I am very clued in to seeing, okay, who is represented in that way or not. And so in noticing this, uh, I started to ground myself in disability theory to kind of figure out what to do next. So this is next slide I will share with you. Two pivotal frameworks for looking at disability within archival collections. Um, and yes, these come from a broad view of disability, but they can be applicable to looking specifically at mental illness and neurodiversity. The first one is crippling the archives which is by Sarah White. Um, if you're going to read anything uh, about disability in archives, I highly suggest these two works. She advocates for using complex embodiment, which is a term coined by disability theorist Tobin Sievers. And in practice, this means looking at disability beyond the medical and social models, looking at how people self-identify and viewing disability not as a static category, but as an experience, a thing that fluctuates over time and is subject to change. Another pivotal work is Archival Assemblages by Grayson Brillmeyer, and they support looking at archives under a political relational framework. And what that means is challenging archival assemblages, which are the multiple perspectives, the power structures, and cultural influences that all affect the creation and handling of archival records. And we'll talk more about how these theories and frameworks really come into play. So in looking at the Austin History Center's collections, we have you know, multiple collecting units like many archives. There really are only five 
archival collections in which neurodiversity and mental illness are represented or played a decisive role in the creator's lives. Now that does not mean there are not more. <laughs> These are the only question, uh, collections that have any description that would indicate so. We have subject files that include clippings and ephemera and organizations and institutions uh, created to assist or treat neurodiverse and mentally ill people. Published reports, usually from a governmental standpoint, um, such as Austin Travis County Interval Care and Austin State Hospital. A robust periodical collection, which as we'll talk in a little bit, is probably um, our main sort of entry into understanding the, the local history of neurodivergent and mentally ill people. And overall massive gaps in accessioning materials created by neurodivergent and mentally ill people and self-advocacy groups. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, our likely lack of description even indicating that those identities are present. Um, so can everyone hear me? Um, I wanted to share a couple items that document neurodiversity and mental illness history in Austin through uh, our periodicals collections, uh, as Jenna just mentioned. The RAG was an underground newspaper published in Austin from 1966 to 77, and digitized copies of the newspaper are available online via Independent Voices, which is an open access digital collection of alternative press. There are also original copies in our report, repository, as well as the Dolph Briscoe Center at UT and at Michigan State University. In several issues of the RAG, there are personal narratives of people who experienced institutionalization and used the publication to seek group support from like-minded individuals. The Mental Patients Liberation Project, uh, also known as MPLP, was one group that evolved from this. They met at the University of Texas at Austin, YWCA, also known as the University Y in the 1970s. In processing the YWCA records of Greater Austin, or sorry, the YWCA of Greater Austin records, which I'm currently still working on, um, it's, it's a pretty huge collection. Um, I came across notes from some of the organizers of Austin's MPLP group. And initially I was like, oh, you know, MPLP is more product less, or more pro whatever, more product less process. Um, but no, it is um, the Mental Patients Liberation Project. And um, I was only able to find more information about this group through the RAG um, in documenting the patients' rights movements that were happening locally here in Austin in the 1970s. So going on to um, within our periodicals collection, the most robust resource we have on documenting the history of anyone with a different brain is the Austin American Statesman. So um, oftentimes, as you can see here, um, legal cases, uh, advocacy efforts are captured. Um, for a long time too, the Austin American Statesman would also publish information about people who were adjudged insane, quote unquote, and institutionalized at Austin State Hospital. So this is where you will really see documentation of individuals' lives. However, this is the caveat, is that these are not typically from the standpoint of people with lived experience. So even though it is a rich resource, it is coming from that, that outsider's perspective. It can sometimes be exploitative or um, um, uh, sort of uh, not sort of true to the realities of the people that they capture. So in looking at our collections, um, and this was part of a bigger initiative to revamp our disability subject guide. And initially, it was primarily concerned with people who have physical disabilities, the blind and deaf communities, and to a lesser extent, some people with intellectual disabilities, um, specifically Down syndrome. Um, there was actually only one reference to autism, <laughs> period, um, you know, zero to ADHD. Uh, it, it, it's just was kind of bereft. And so after adding resources, that I could find by trying various subject terms within our databases. What I found was that there's an overall lack of representation, sparse description uh, in our archives and manuscripts collections, 
there's a, some use of outdated and ableist descriptive terminology that we are very soon going to work on, including mentally handicapped and, and just almost zero materials that we know of that were created by people who were neurodivergent or mentally ill. Um, so just lots of um, problem areas that, you know, some of which still need to be addressed, but um, were addressed as best as I could at the time. So some strategies that uh, Kelly and I have discussed for going forward with includes re-indexing, looking at updated Library of Congress subject terms, and specifically using local terms and community descriptors. Um, that means really cluing in to what people um, who are neurodivergent and mentally ill are identifying themselves as, how they see themselves, the language that they use. This also includes close reading of collections, using those frameworks of complex embodiment and archival assemblages to glean those less visible representations of neurodiversity and mental illness. This means really having somebody go in and read manuscripts with that historical lens to determine, oh yes, you know, this person was neurodivergent, et cetera. This also means connecting with people who are neurodivergent or mentally ill from um, a you know, community solidarity standpoint through programming, through donations, et cetera, making them part of our um, broader you know, archival community that we serve. And then having intentional conversations with donors about their materials so that donors' voices are very much involved in how they are reflected in finding aids, et cetera. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about donor relations and privacy concerns at the Austin History Center. Um, during the pandemic shutdown, I worked closely with our archives curator, Molly Holtz, on formulating a donor checklist that archivists can use when meeting with new donors. Um, and this hasn't been finalized, but I am sharing some segments from the draft of the checklist here. Among other items, the checklist contains a section on description so that we can be more intentional about recording the donor's preferred descriptive terms and also their prefer preferences for how the collection is processed, described, and accessed, including addressing privacy concerns about sensitive materials and personally identifiable information. Some of the questions that Jenna and I have been considering when thinking about working with incoming collections that document neurodivergent people and organizations are, what does someone want to disclose or not disclose? How does the emergence of advocacy and rights movements change a person's willingness to share disability? And what are the legal and ethical issues surrounding privacy of mental disability? In April of last year, I processed the Charles and Fanny Norman papers, which I'm gonna share with you as a case study in privacy issues. Charles and Fanny were artists and teachers who lived and worked in Austin in the 20th century. Fanny Norman paid her way through the University of Texas by working as a nurse at St. David's Hospital and at Austin State Hospital. So there's a small collection of photographs documenting these hospitals, as well as Holy Cross Hospital in East Austin. The Austin State Hospital materials include photographs of buildings, grounds, and staff, but also photographs she took of patients. There is a small series of photos that document a young African-American male patient chained to a tree on the grounds in 1947. It's impossible to know why she took these photos and they are extremely difficult to view and they document the abuse very clearly. I wondered if she took picture after picture as evidence of the harm or who she shared these with after. Another collection of photos she took was during a civil rights protest in Austin led by local black activist Booker T. Bonner in 1964. Still, we can only speculate as to why she took the photos of the chained patient. Other photographs show white patients in the dining hall and in hallways. While there is such little visual documentation of patients' lives inside ASH, making these photos accessible clearly violates ethical and legal codes and we, we did restrict access. So here are the access restrictions for the collection that are in the finding aid. The patient photographs are restricted under Texas Health and Safety Codes regarding the rights of patients and confidentiality of records. 
these sections of the state health code state that records of a mental health facility that directly or indirectly identify a present, former, or proposed patient are confidential unless disclosure is permitted by other state law. And so we've advised our researchers to consult with our managing archivist or curator of archives um, to be able to work with the state to request access as Fanny was a um, employee of the state when she took the photographs. So here is a photo within the collection that uh, Fanny Norman did take of a handyman named Ilo Baca, who she wrote on the back was a former ASH patient. Um, since he was an employee of the hospital at the time of the photograph, we did not restrict access. And from um, learning uh, in Jenna's research of ASH, it wasn't uncommon for former patients to um, gain employment there um, after they were patients. So. There. So, um, in conclusion, um, we want to recognize some of the challenges, which are not insurmountable, but things that need to be acknowledged for going forward. First of all, there are a lot of fluctuations in current grassroots terminology. Um, there is, uh, there are folks who are very pro person first uh, versus identity first language and vice versa. Um, there is terminology that is emerging that is more inclusive towards trans and non-binary people, such as the term neuroqueer, uh, which means um, how uh, one's brain and one's um, queerness are, are intertwined and, and kind of connected. So new emerging terms. You have to consider the context in which records were created from an intersectional standpoint. And one of the uh, most uh, extreme examples that I have found is uh, if you look at census data from the mid 19th century, people who were enslaved who tried to seek freedom were pathologized for that. They were considered mentally ill. So you want to look at this you know, through the framework of the time um, in which the record was created and not just assume, oh yes, this person was mentally ill or whatnot because the record says so. You want to avoid retroactively diagnosing individuals. There are you know, obviously ethical re uh, issues with that. And you, know, you don't have the person in front of you who's able to confirm or give any qualitative information. There is still a lot of stigma and silencing of neurodivergence and mental illness, both in the historical record and currently. It's hard to come out. It's hard for people to say, yes, um, the people documented in my collections um, you know, had a mental illness, they had autism, et cetera. People are scared. Um, and then finally, improving description requires a lot of learning from disabled people and disciplines outside of the archives, um, which even though it is necessary, um, it still is time, it's labor, which have to be considered. Um, and so this concludes our presentation. Um, if y'all have any questions, this is our contact information. Um, and uh, we're, we're happy to fill you in with more info. And that is it. And I need to stop sharing. There we go. Perfect. OK, now it is me and Jenna. So do you want to? You all just met Jenna. Yes. <laughs> you can <introduce. laughs> I, I'm Elizabeth. Um, I'm the archivist and records manager for the Hogg Foundation for Mental Health. Um, Jenna and I are going to talk about, so building on what Jenna and Kelly just talked about, um, Jenna and I co-chaired a work group that was part of a larger project for the Austin State Hospital redesign. And we co-chaired the sharing of the history of ASH work group. So we're going to talk about that project and the work that we did to, um, to uh, preserve the history of ASH. So um, the ASH redesign project is a part of a larger project that includes a statewide plan to revitalize and expand five of the 10 state hospitals in Texas. 
In the last legislative session, the Texas Health and Human Services Commission, or HHSC, received money to reinvent ASH as a comprehensive center for brain health that better serves patients' continuum of needs. So DelMed was contracted by HHSC to lead the ASH Redesign Collaborative and convened multiple work groups with members of the Central Texas community to make recommendations and provide input on the redesign process. So like I said, last year, Jenna and I co-chaired the work group focused on making recommendations on sharing the history of ASH. And I am just gonna put in the chat this link um, to the project's website. So you can get a lot more background information um, and you can also directly see our uh, recommendations. All right, so for a brief history of Austin State Hospital, I am also going to put in the chat a link to the Handbook of Texas's entry on ASH so that you guys can learn more if you like. ASH is very significant in the history of Texas and in the history of the country. It was the first psychiatric facility built west of the Mississippi River and one of the few remaining institutions built using the Kirkbride plan, which when a lot of people think of asylums, they think of the Kirkbride plan with um, a building that is uh, sort of neoclassical, very segregated, um, you know, uh, surrounded by wide lawns, trees, etc. And originally, and this is how this connects with uh, neurodivergence, is ASH took patients who had other conditions besides mental illness. This included autism, dementia, epilepsy, intellectual disabilities, syphilis, tuberculosis, until the early 20th century. So ASH is very significant in the history of a much broader community. It was also um, very reflective of its surroundings. It was historically segregated by race, um, uh, gender, type of disability, and racial integration occurred very slowly. Uh, it was also affected by the movement towards deinstitutionalization, which occurred due to people uh, fighting for their rights, activism. Uh, and uh, increase in individualized treatment, patient rights, use of psychotropic medications and community services, um, which led to um, the ASH population being significantly reduced. So in making our recommendations, Jen and I both uh, happened to take one particular course um, at separate points at UT, which was Rebecca Elder's Management of Preservation Programs. And that was very essential to how we framed our recommendations. Um, we also made sure to include references to the resources we use, such as the NEDCC preservation leaflets, the National Park Service preservation briefs, um, just so that you know, we were making the recommendations, but someone else was going to be implementing them. And so we just wanted to make sure that they had uh, the information that they needed um, in order to complete the work. Um, and finally, Mary Call, um, who was a member of the working group, did just this amazing research on how other states shared the history of state hospitals. And she found a wide range of examples from institutions that catered to the problematic framing of horror by turning their historical hospital buildings into haunted houses, to the classification of those buildings as historical landmarks, to repurposing the buildings as event spaces and hotels, and um, finally to those that created museums and archives showcasing the history. So I'm just gonna link, these are our full recommendations. Um, and if you go to page 13, you can see the extensive research that Mary Call did. So we divided our recommendations into three broad domains. We had preservation recommendations, interpretation recommendations, and funding recommendations. So our two main preservation recommendations were, first of all, to hire a project manager to oversee this, somebody who has experience with grant writing, with preservation, interpretation, collections management, uh, we advocated for them to receive at least $50,000 a year before benefits for a three to five year long term. 
And this person would identify additional team members, determine budget objectives, apply for funding, and engage with local communities and leadership, including Ashes African American History, their con cultural consultant, archaeological investigators, and the Texas Historical Commission. And this person would also be responsible to, for making sure that a complete review of the collections and their current environment was done. Um, we had the privilege to tour the Ashe campus and um, where a number of artifacts and some records are stored. There is mold, um, the building is not um, completely sealed, so there is access uh, for insects to get in, not climate controlled, um, just not an ideal environment. And this person would most likely need to partner with local higher education institutions in order to develop a preservation plan after doing an assessment, getting collections management software and creating an inventory, uh, because currently, um, or when we did this work at the time, it was unknown exactly what was on site. So for the interpretation recommendations, um, we mostly outlined the need to lay a solid groundwork um, before creating a museum, tours, websites, or anything like that. So first we, want, um, we outlined that they should identify themes, advocacy goals, audience needs and preferences, civic engagement opportunities, and developing communication and marketing plans. We were hoping that by spending more time up front, being thoughtful about how the history is shared, will hopefully prevent any problematic traps and privacy concerns that we've talked, everyone here has talked extensively about. So finally, for funding recommendations, what we tried to do was look at all the potential options that Austin State Hospital could leverage, which included partnering with local higher education institutions, utilizing the Texas Grants Resource Center, partnering with uh, historic preservation entities from the local to the national level, um, seeking partnerships with local businesses and corporations, partnering with the many complementary organizations in town, such as the Museum at the Texas School for the Deaf, fundraising and partnering with community arts organizations. And we listed uh, a multiple um, organizations, institutions, um, et cetera, that would be able to um, assist Ash in gaining more funding uh, since even though they were endowed with an initial um, financial push by the Texas legislator, there is no guarantee that there will be more money in the future for ASH in this uh, respect. So great news. Um, based on our recommendations, we did see that HHSC put out a job posting for a preservation and grant coordinator for ASH. Um, they've also hired a woman to lead another work group specifically dedicated to connecting and sharing the African American history of the campus. Um, they also had a, hired a company to conduct archaeological investigations of the campus ground because they were building a new hospital, tearing down some older buildings, just doing a lot of work. Um, and that company gathered more than 3,000 artifacts from the campus, and those will be categorized and preserved. And the Hogg Foundation for Mental Health, which is where I work, um, gave Dr. King Davis a grant to identify, organize, and produce digital copies of many of Ash's historical documents, including admission, treatment, and discharge records. So this project is still in progress. Um, it was severely de delayed by the pandemic. You know, access to the campus was limited. And then, of course, HHSC has been bombarded with a whole host of other issues at the moment. Um, but he did do a similar project um, in Virginia for the Central State Hospital there. It's amazing. You can read a little bit more about it here. Um, and then just finally, um, work groups for, there's a phase three and they're being reconvened. Um, we haven't heard yet what the future of the History of Ash work group is going to be like, but if you're in Texas and you're interested, you can reach out to me or Jenna and we can keep you connected and updated. So that's it. All right.
I'm going to pass the baton to John. Um, hi, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry, don't have. So in, in honor of Lyric, um, I am a far lighter than I think I am, mixed race faculty member at Texas State. Um, I've published, I've written and co-edited a book on public health and race, um, one at the Texas-Mexico border and one here. Um, if you look at the image I have there, um, it looks like a cowboy um, and it's sort of like taken from below, but I wanted behind the cowboy, there's um, a building under construction and it's actually not a cowboy, it's a vaquero. And it's written by a poem by sort of like Whitliff, who um, wrote about how the vaquero experience has been ignored and effaced in Texas history. And the reason I start with um, cattle work is because of my grandfather's work as a mule train operator in Colombia and my uncle's uh, work. He dropped out of um, school in second grade, never learned to read, but still was able to lead a productive life. So thinking about how do we bring these experiences, sort of like thinking intersectionally about, um, about getting these stories into the archives. So um, I told uh, Jenna, this is slightly outside of what I'm working on right now, but I wanted to talk about my experience as a mentor and as faculty member and trying to get so many of my students who've had um, experiences of mental illness, who are neurodivergent, who confess that they're neurodivergent, sort of like a project that wouldn't necessarily um, conform to the medical model, that I wouldn't be sending them to looking at mental illness records and something else. And the issue here, so I thought I would do sort of like an initial research trip um, using the uh, OnLARC archival material that would be available through uh, the Whitliff collection. And then I felt that I was only pigeonholing the Whitliff collection, then the Ransom collection, and then the Texas State Library collection. So a lot of this kind of repeats uh, what uh, Jenna and Elizabeth and Kelly and Lyric have done, but I just want to do it kind of as a case study. So after my full experience of running through a number of categories, there is the all roads lead to Michael Nye, a partner of Naomi Shihab Nye. There was an exhibit in the Whitliff from 2013 to 2014. And these are sort of like the pictures that he shared um, based on the experiences, um, documenting through photography and through interviews, um, a number of the people who were mentally ill that he spent a great deal of time with. Um, and this is the archive for people who might show up in the following categories I used. So to get to Michael Nye, I used neurodiverse um, and neurodiverse, uh, I wanted to focus on papers and archives because to give people a chance to be able to do this, um, neurodiverse does not show up as a relevant category in the Whitliff collections or in the Harry Ransom collection. And the books in the Texas State Library have much more to do with um, Um, with the clinical definition of neurodiversity. Um, then I tried looking through a number of other um, terms, eccentric, to see if that was something that came up. Um, it showed up twice in the papers for the Whitliff Collection. It showed up 61 times in Hare Ransom Collection. For asylum, um, there were two, but these of course led back to Michael Nye's um, discussion. The 13 books were histories of asylums in Texas State Library. And I was going by the title, not to see where it showed up in the sort of like keywords and um, 27 times in the Harry Ransom collection. Um, and then I decided to use the C word, crazy to see what would happen. Um, you can't see it right here, but there are approximately 127 entries and most of them were song titles um, from the Whitliff collection. So if you wanted to explore song titles that use neurodivergent terms or neurodivergent stigmas, um, that's kind of the situation where you'd end up. Then using clinical terms, um, this, again, the Whitliff collection brought me back to the Michael Nye photo collection that was there. Um, a number of books in the Texas State Library that dealt with directly and the Harry Ransom collection, but most of the kids from the Harry Ransom collection dealt directly with Lucia Joyce, who was the daughter of James Joyce. And the Ransom collection has, I would call it the sort of like massive enterprise of documenting James Joyce um, contribution to the literary arts and Western culture. Um, so Lucia Joyce, because uh, he was their daughter, she was their daughter, um, shows up in this particular thing under the rubric of mental illness in terms of these things. So I would have to say, using the online archive, especially given that um, 
the wit lift was closed for most of this time in terms of being able to access it, I then got in touch with my friends at uh, the wit lift and I said, do you have any um, authors you think that might be neurodiverse? Um, not asking for a diagnosis, just seeing like what would particularly show up. And the people they mentioned, and I think Sandra, um, were Mary Hunter Austin and Peggy Ponchurch based on the kinds of um, letters that people exchange with each other. Beverly Lowry is someone he said, they said that sort of like dealt a lot with sort of like mental illness and depression. Um, Gary Cartwright was referred to as a gonzo journalist uh, working on the border. He's one of my favorite um, writers as well. Uh, John Graves as well was another person who sort of like um, had uh, suffered severe injuries during World War II, probably had a post-diagnosis um, PTSD and uh, Michael Nye again in terms of these categories. So if I were to sort of like ask people to sort of like spend some time in their papers, you'd be looking at the correspondence that shows up in these situations. So I have to say it was both uh, frustrating as someone who's trying to teach this, but also deeply educational in terms of looking at the um, the limits of the terms we use when you try to escape from the medical model, but it shows up again. Um, and um, so I'm not saying that people should, don't spend time in hospitals, don't spend time in asylums. That's no, there's no issue with sort of like seeking help, but it would be nice to have sort of like people's fuller lives discussed, especially sort of like in the creative arts in the process. So um, this is kind of where I am, but I also want to do it to sort of like point out the really important work Lyric, Kelly, and Jenna um, are doing and have been doing as well. Um, and then this is a picture of me in a mask that has my name, John McKernan Gonzalez uh, by Sneha Shanoi, uh, who is now a graduating senior from a high school in Houston. Uh, thank you all, and I look forward to our conversations. So do I hand this back to Jenna or to Mike? I think it comes back to me. I'll turn my video back on. Uh, so uh, please join me uh, in a virtual round of applause for the great presentations. Uh, you can either clap visually or use the reaction button on Zoom or however you would like to show your appreciation for these wonderful uh, presenters. Uh, uh, just a reminder that if you have questions, uh, please post them in the chat. We have about 13 minutes left of the session. so. Uh, we will uh, get to as many questions as we can. Uh, the first question that came up, uh, Sharon had asked if uh, uh, Jenna could post the link to the uh, article, the second article from the archival science that was on your slide. Maybe you could post the links to both uh, because someone had to step away from the screen and could not catch that. Uh, so if you could post that in the chat window, Jenna, that would be uh, great for the uh, attendees to have. Uh, and then we had a question from Melissa Lawton, uh, and I think this is for all the presenters, and this is a, a great question, and I'm looking forward to hearing the answers. Uh, so Melissa's question was, what are your thoughts in regards to researchers using archival collections to retroactively diagnose or draw conclusions about mental illness, queerness, or neurodivergency of people who are either documented in or themselves created the collections? Do we have an ethical responsibility to intercede or is this an infringement of their rights as researchers? And I'm not sure who wants to take that, but that's a great question that might not have an easy answer. I have, um, I will post a link to this work. Um, let me find the title. It's, um, I believe it's called The Oddest Man in the Room. And it, it was created by a historian who was researching an individual who had autistic traits in the 18th century. Now this researcher, I, I think um, their work is very, um, very careful not to diagnose, but to bring to light how there are these signifiers embedded in historical documents that can give us insight into, okay, we can't say for sure that this person was autistic. However, um, there seems to be some representation here. So it is a very fine ethical line. Um, and I feel that, that that piece was just one of the best examples that I've come across of, of doing, it, um, doing it justice in a, a, an ethical way. 
Yeah. And I'll say, you know, my thoughts on this too, where it's like, you know, I, it's been suspected I had ADHD for a lot of years, but until I could sit with a professional and really dive into it, all of those things were just hints. You know, they were hints until we looked at the whole package of the person, which often is impossible to do without having that person present with you. Uh, although you know, that's also why it's nicer to talk in the language of neurodivergence, different type of thinker, different type of expressor, um, instead of a very medicalized pathological mindset when we're talking about people, because then it's like we're also not pathologizing someone who is not here to speak on themselves. And, you know, sometimes we can tell more easily that someone was definitely neurodivergent because it's a really big umbrella, but we might not be able to know specifics about that without having a person here. Uh, so it's like, oh, here's some hints. Here's some hints, like hints, maybe, you know, things to look for. But you, you really can't, if, especially like with historical figures, you know, even though it's fun to like say, oh, I want to claim Einstein. You know, a lot of people say Einstein was autistic. I'm like, we can't know that. Although I, I understand why you want to say that, but we can't say that, you know, it's not, Einstein's not here. I also just wonder, so thinking about, you know, your role as the archivist and their role as the researcher and what your relationship and connection is with them. And if you can at least have a conversation um, about what they're researching and how they're portraying the subject and um, at least, you know, see, putting the seeds of these ideas in their mind um, is the smallest thing. And just to jump, uh on to what Elizabeth was just saying, but also Lyric and Jenna. Um, like Lyric was saying, you know, Einstein is not here. <laughs> but I think going forward, you know, having conversations with donors about what they are willing to disclose um, will further um, research and just historical um, narratives about neurodivergent people. So, um, you know, but as far as going, um, you know, retroactively, I think what Elizabeth said was beautiful about trying to just have a discussion with the researcher. Um, yeah. Um, I'm just going to sort of like speak as a historian, and I think people take normal for granted. And I think thinking historically about how this category of normal operates as much as thinking as much at how someone might have been, again, eccentric, um, focused, et cetera, et cetera, is really important. So, um, I mean, I think sort of like the classic gay New York, uh, George Chauncey's book that looks like the category of heterosexual had to be invented to create homosexual as a, as a lived category as well. So thinking about neurodivergence historically and then the movement people did between these different categories would be really important to document as well. So like, what are the categories that exclude the adult? And I want to go back to um, sort of like immigration history. The uh, act that sort of like creates sort of like the ability to exclude people based on disability and disease is the 1895 Immigration Act. And they happily conflated um, syphilis, tuberculosis, um, perversity, um, and eccentricity, giving people the opportunity to do that. Um, and the sort of like biggest um, reason people were excluded was, of course, like to become a public charge. But that sort of like sense of disability being part of the immigration history is kind of erased. And people have been pushing to get people to take that seriously. So um, it's, I would say it's deeply, deeply ethically problematic, but it's also as ethically problematic not to try to think about neurodiversity and perhaps just like the history of the brain um, back then. And now as well. Yeah, that's important too, because there's an argument sometimes it's like, oh, where are all these new, there weren't all these autism kids and these ADHD kids when I was growing up. It's like, no, no, we've, we've, we've always been here. We were often just shepherded into other labels or the diagnostic criteria was a bit different. And now it, it's more inclusive than it was. So I think, yeah, we, we have to talk about it too, because it's like, yeah, we really have always been here. We just weren't defined up into a point. Yeah, I don't see any more questions, uh, but, but I liked your, your point, Lyric, about the fact that you know, we've always been there because it hasn't been defined. Yeah, someone who got his you know, neurodivergent diagnosis at the age of uh, 42 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and I got my formal TS diagnosis, even though I had had the symptoms of TS uh, since I was a child. And it's just, it was one of those that, you know, for a long time, people thought that only people who yelled and cursed were truly had Tourette's and everybody else was just weird. Uh, so I grew up being the weird kid until, yeah, and I'm still weird, which is okay. I'll, I'll own weird. I don't mind it at all. Uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, but it's interesting yeah it's it's these things aren't new it's just we're we're, we're finally learning to to understand them and, and maybe apply definitions and terms to them so that we can you know perhaps uh, have a more inclusive conversation you know like we're having today which is wonderful so yeah and not new at all you know like oh gosh people like you know i've also got epilepsy and so if people have Tourette's and epilepsy we probably would have been ex- given an exorcism once upon a time. You know, if you go back far enough, it's like, we've definitely always been here. They just, uh, just think about how the pathology, like just from like, this is a problem there, you're possessed, like how that impacts people to like now it's like, oh, you're ill, you're mentally ill. It's like, okay, no, I exist. I'm just different, you know? Well, we have four more minutes. If anybody has any more questions, we will give it just a few more seconds. If not, we will wind this down. Going once, going twice. All right, well, one more time, if everybody can please join me in a virtual round of applause to Lyric, Jenna, Kelly, Elizabeth, and John on these great presentations. This was a a great session. Uh, I know I thoroughly enjoyed it and got some great things out of it. Uh, so next on our schedule, before everybody leaves, we have our, what do we have next? We have our all attendee virtual reception and trivia game at 4 p.m. So I hope I see everybody there uh, uh, and play the game. So hopefully we got some great prizes, uh, more than bragging rights. So y'all have a great afternoon. Thank y'all for coming and we'll see y'all at the next session. Bye, thank you. Thanks everyone.